Okay, looking into Daniel chapter 10, 11 and 12, it's basically just a repetition from what Daniel saw in um, chapter 8 and 9, uh, in chapter 7 and 8, where, uh, you know, Gabriel just continued to explain to him about the different wars. He just goes into more detail when it comes to the um, kingdoms that will come to rise. We know that is in the time now of the Medo Persian um, reign and so what Gabriel then begins to do is just to explain to him what's going to happen during the time of we've already discussed what happens with Antioch and then after after the Greek period we will find um, the Roman period coming up and the Roman Empire taking control okay so we understand when we read chapter 10 and chapter 11 of Daniel um, Gabriel is just reiterating and just bringing more clarity on the wars that will take place. Um, he says in chapter 10, um, Daniel sees a vision of a man. So in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, revelation was given to Daniel and its message was true and it concerned a great war. So this will just be more in detail so that um, when we look back at this, we can identify the landmarks we can identify all the kings that came up that ruled and reigned based on how Daniel has written down what the angel has described to him, what will take place. But one thing we can look at that will take us into the book of Revelation is when we look at how Daniel describes this man that he saw, um, chapter 10 verse Five, he says, I looked up and there before me was a man dressed in linen with a belt of the finest gold around his waist. His body was like chrysolite, his face like lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze and his voice like the sound of a multitude. That's basically the only thing I would like to just highlight when it comes here. If you continue to read, you will just read what we've already read in chapter 8, just in a little bit more detail, which I'm not going to go into. Um, if we look at the descriptions of this man and we look at the man that, that John saw in Revelation chapter 1, similar things. Maybe his wording changed a little bit because of, you know, who they are. But you're looking at the same person, okay? He speaks about the three kings that will appear in Persia. Again, he continues to just um, explain to Daniel everything that will happen between these uh, four kingdoms that will rise up. Also, just to give us a better understanding who he was talking about, if we go back and we look at history, we can identify the times. There's obviously no time period placed here, but we can identify who he was talking about based on the details that is given there. And I'm not going to go into that. It's, you know, it's, it's a whole lot of... Um, Kings that came up, a whole lot of uh, deception and, you know, like it is, wars happening for this king to overpower a certain um, country and a certain state. And so you will find then um, it all ends sort of with the work of Antioch as being this type of Antichrist, which we've discussed in chapter, um, in chapter 8. So I'm not going to go into that detail any, any further. However, when we begin to look and we read through chapter 11, if we go into um, uh, verse 28, it speaks about the king of the north will return to his own country with great wealth, but his heart will be set against the holy covenant and he will take action and he then return to his country. So we see that that is still speaking about Antiochus and at the end of verse 32, it says, with flattery will corrupt those who have violated the covenant, but the people who know their God will firmly resist him. Again, speaking about the Maccabeans who came into power and this Macca uh, Maccabean revolt, then these men stood up or this group of, of, of Jews stood up against Antioch, defeated him. And then obviously that is when Israel was re reinstated, their sacrifices was reinstated in the temple. Okay, if you continue to read, um, you will find that coming to verse 36 now, okay, 
the narrative changes and now we're looking at this king that will exalt himself okay clearly if you read you begin to read that this is not any human king and this has not happened any time in history yet so it is something that is still to come all right it begins to say that um the the king will do as he pleases we at chapter chapter 11 verse 36 begins to say that the king will do as he pleases he will exalt and magnify himself above every god and he will say um and he will say unheard of things against the god of god which means things that he will blaspheme against god which we've already heard is something that the antichrist will do he will be successful until the time of wrath is completed for what has been determined must take place he will show no regard for any god he will show no regard for the gods of his fathers or for the one desired by woman nor will he regard any god but will exalt himself above them all okay so what verse 37 basically speaks about is that he obviously will not worship any other god he will not have any religious history or any religious ties ties to any religion at the time simply because he wants to be the god that you want people to worship so he will not have any ties he will not have any interest in woman it says there that you know um for the one desired by woman clearly because what he's trying to establish now is to bring about false god right he is he is going to imitate um being god and for that he want everybody to look look up to him as being the one and true god Therefore, he's basically trying to copy what Jesus did in Jesus' ministry. Jesus was never married. Okay. Jesus didn't serve any other gods. He didn't come from any other religion where he could have served any other god. When we look back at Abram, maybe um, Abram served other gods before he was called by by God and so there will be no trace of any other religious history in his background so that is one trait that we can look at um, when we're looking at who this guy is going to be when he comes into power right he will exalt himself above all instead of them he will honor a god of fortresses a god unknown to his fathers he will honor with gold and silver with precious stone and costly gifts right this basically just means that he's going to be in control of commerce okay if we look at chapter 13 in the book of revelation and we click it quickly read there it says i saw a beast coming out of the sea he had ten horns and seven heads with ten crowns on his horns, and on each head a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard, but had feet like those of a bear, and a mouth like that of a lion. The dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. Okay, the dragon refers to Satan. So in this instance, we learn now, if we look at who this man is, it is a combination of the four beasts, that um, we looked at in Daniel 7. We are about him having the ten horns and the seven heads, and then on these heads he had ten crowns on his horns. So this clearly speaks of the previous um, dream that Daniel saw that John is now experiencing in Revelation 13. So we find that this mark of the false um, a mark of the Antichrist will comes from a, a false prophet and this is when we go back and see um, how this how this man will honor a god of fortresses a god that is unknown to his fathers okay and then one thing we can quickly look at when we look at verse 40 is at the time of the end of um, the king of the south will engage him in battle and the king of the north will storm out against him with chariots and cavalry and great and a great fleet of ship, uh, ships he will invade many countries and sweep through them like a flood he will also invade the beautiful land many countries will fall but Edom, Moab and the leaders of Ammon will be delivered from his hand so just basically looking at the first two when he says that the king of the south will engage him in battle and the king of the north remember when we look back at the bees with the ten horns it says that there will be ten horns but three of the horns obviously um, will be destroyed so this is where we're looking at the time when 
the Antichrist will wage war against the king of the north and the king of the south. He will obviously try and overthrow these kingdoms, the ten kingdoms that will rise up, which was the ten horns that we looked at in previous chapters of the book of Daniel. So we find that this is now during this war when these um, three kingdoms will fall. And then obviously the, the rest, the seven, will then just clearly begin to submit. But it says that, that he continues to destroy um, others with great fleet with the with cavalry and a great fleet of ships so you will invade many countries and sweep through them like a flood which means he will obviously take control of the rest of the seven or all ten of these kingdoms so that ultimately he will be the eleventh horn that will come into power and then rule and reign from that position okay then we can look at chapter 12 um, quickly chapter 12 is basically if you read chapter 12 it's a very short chapter but chapter 12 just reads like the book of revelation if you read it you will almost think that you are in 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 a in a in a, in a chapter of revelation but let's quickly try and go through that and then by that we can wrap up um, the book of daniel okay so now the heading here tells us that it is the end times Okay, which means we're going to have the opportunity to look further into the end times. So after these things has happened now, where the Antichrist has come and he has overpowered the ten kingdoms, um, he is the eleventh horn that is coming into power. Um, Daniel tells us, starting chapter 12 with, at that time, Michael, right, the great prince who protects your people will arise, which just means that it's a continuation there's really no break or no um, years or anything in between. While that war is taking place, Michael who protects your people will arise. Which means Michael has been put into a position. The archangel Michael was assigned to guard the people of Israel. So he arises, okay? Meaning that he just come, he's just coming now and he's taking action and he's beginning to bring this Gentile age, this tribulation to an end. And that only ends with the second coming. But these things still need to happen for us to get to that place. All right. It says that there will be a time of distress such as not, not happened um, from the beginning of nations until then. He says, but at that time your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book will be delivered. All right. So when we look at the book, when we speak about the book, we're looking at um, the book of life. Okay, we're to be talking about the book of life, which is spoken about in quite a few, quite a few references being made in the New Testament about this book of life. Um, it just holds the names of the saints that is destined uh, for the kingdom, which is Jews and Gentiles. So he basically refers to when he's when he's speaking to Daniel here, he's making reference to your people, which is Israel, which is the Jewish people, and they will be delivered now. Okay, remember they got into trouble um, a good couple of hundred years ago. Okay. And if I can just quickly bring that into perspective here. If we look at Jeremiah 2, it says there, Israel forsakes God. It continues to read that the word of the Lord came to me. Go and proclaim in the hearing of the Jerusalem. I remember the devotion of your youth. How is a bride you loved me and followed me through the desert, through a land not sown? Israel was holy to the Lord, the first fruits of a harvest. All who devoured her were yelled guilty, and disaster overtook them. Okay, he continues to say um, that Israel begin to um, commit their sins when we look at verse 13. It says, My people have committed two sins, they have forsaken me the spring of the living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Is Israel a servant, a slave by birth? Why then has he become, why then has he become plundered? Okay, he begins, uh, Jeremiah begins to speak about how God saved Israel, how God rescued Israel, how Israel became the first fruits and how um, Israel was God's, was Jesus' bride or God's bride. And now Jesus will come back for his bride. And we begin to see then they committed these sins where they begin to reject the Messiah. And they obviously, they forsaken God. 
So now when we begin to see all those people in chapter 12 now will be delivered. Verse 2 says the multitude who sleep in the dust of the, of the earth will awake some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting content. Okay, very familiar scripture. Those people who have fallen asleep, we know are the people who, who died in Christ. Okay, they are dead in Christ. And so all of them will be awakened. It will be the time for resurrection. We begin to see that it's a moment that Gabriel descri describes as the moment of Israel's resurrection. Okay, we understand there is three resurrections if you understand the word of god we find that the first resurrection will be when the gentile when the church will be resurrected this is before tribulation when we're speaking about the rapture the church and all the gentile nations will be uh, all right and then if we read on it says others to shame and everlasting content so these will be the people that will awake to everlasting content and we know that that means that their destination will be in eternal um, damnation internal contempt where they will be in the lake of fire all right so now we begin to see that um, those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens and those who lead many to righteousness like stars forever and ever which means we will have our 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 robes of white our white linen that we will care that we will be wearing not just us but the israelites and then daniel goes and he says but you daniel close up and seal the words of the scroll until the time of the end many will go here and there and increase knowledge so let's just pause there quickly i just want us to look at that scroll that daniel will be closing up now so clearly it's not the book of daniel it's not his prophecies if it was we wouldn't have had this book now so what is the scroll that Daniel is talking about? What is the scroll that um, Gabriel is telling Daniel that he needs to close? That he needs to close. So we look at that little scroll now. We look at that scroll now. Let's just quickly um, continue to read. He says he switches over. He says, "Then I, Daniel, looked, and there before me stood two others, one on this bank of the river, and on the opposite side." Um, one of them said to the man clothed in linen, so which means there was three people that Daniel could see. It was the one on, on the, the side of the river, the other one on the opposite bank of the river, and then one of them, which was the man that was clothed in linen, who we spoke about earlier of, um, he was above the waters of the river. How long will it be before these astonishing things are fulfilled? Okay, the man clothed in linen, who is Jesus, was above the waters of the river, lifted his right hand and his left hand towards heaven. And I heard him swear by him who lives forever, saying, It will be for a time, times, and half a times. And when the power of the holy people has finally broken, um, all these things will be completed. Okay, he said, I heard, but I did not understand. So I asked my Lord, what will the outcome of all this be? So what Daniel is describing now is clearly what we see in Revelation 10, in the book of Revelation 10. So Daniel was given the future of the Israelites in this little scroll that he needed to, um, that he needed to seal up. And so nobody could see this until the time of the end. Okay, so looking at, at Daniel chapter 10 quickly. We, we look at what John saw. And this is amazing because if you look at John's writing here, John says now in chapter 10, Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. He was robed in a cloud with a rainbow above his head. His face was like the sun, his legs like fiery pillars. He was holding a little scroll which laid open in his hand. He planted his right foot on the sea and his left foot um, on the land and he gave a loud shout, shout like the roar of a lion when he shouted the voices of heaven thunders and uh, thunder spoke and it says there um, when he shouted the voices of the seven thunders and when the seven thunders spoke I was about to write but I heard a voice from heaven say seal up what the seven thunders said and do not write it down 
Then the angel I had seen standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven and he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and all that is in them, the earth and all that is in it, and the sea and all that is in it. And he said, There will be no more delay, but in the days when the seventh angel is about to sound this trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished, just as he announced to his servants' prophet. So this is basically a continuation of what Daniel saw. Daniel saw that angel standing on, the, that man in linen, standing on the waters, waters, raising up his one hand to heaven and here we have John seeing the same thing with that little scroll that that contained something that nobody is supposed to see none of us is supposed to see what is written in that scroll only John then will be able to open up the scroll okay uh, verse 8 says then the voice that I had heard from heaven spoke to me once more go take the scroll that lies open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and then he went and he continues to say that take it and eat it it will turn your stomach sour but your mouth um, will be sweet as honey so John took it and he ate it uh, then in verse 11 he says you must prophesy again about many people's nations languages and kings so like any other prophet the scroll when he ate it was sour uh, was sour in his stomach but it was sweet like honey in his mouth which means that when he speaks it will be sweet words but it will be sour because of once he receives the revelation of what is about to happen and what is going to transpire it just gives him this bitter feeling in his mouth so we begin to understand now that chapter 12 just takes us to true into the path of the book of revelation where we see a lot of similarities taking place and then when daniel asked what the outcome of this will be and then the man just said to him, go on your way, Daniel, because the words are closed up and sealed until the time of the end. Many will be purified, made spotless and refined, but the wicked will continue to be wicked. Okay. He continues to say, none of the wicked will understand, but those who are wise will understand. And that just shows us that if you seek to know the truth, and if you seek to know wisdom from God, God will give you the understanding and the wisdom of the things that is going to be and the things that is going to take place then we will find verse 11 says from the time that the daily sacrifice is abolished and the abomination that causes desolation is set up there will be a hundred two thousand and ninety days blessed is the one who waits and who reaches for the end of the hundred 1,335 days. So suddenly the days change. And then he goes on and then he says to Daniel, go on your way till the end. You will rest now. So clearly he tells Daniel, you've come to the end of your journey, the end of what it is that God needed you for. And then um, you will rise and receive his allotted inheritance. Okay. So if we look at this date range quickly, maybe something that's interesting about it is if we try to figure out why he says, blessed are the ones who wait and reaches the end of a few extra days, which works out to an extra 75 days. So if you continue to read the book of Revelation, you will find that there's things that still need to happen after the tribulation. After that um, 1,290 days, okay, we will find that um, suddenly the time is the time limit is longer it's been said here to Daniel that those will be blessed if they continue to 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 stick it out until the end of the 1335 days so there's a 30 day period that we will that will be needed for the cleansing of the temple there will be another 45 day count that we can actually 45 days that we can actually count ourselves blessed if we um, once the kingdom will begin, once the new kingdom will come and it is believed that Matthew 25 plays an important role here where um, Jesus speaks about the separation of the goat and the, and the sheep and clearly you have to think the, about obviously um, the restructuring of the world. The world has been, um, you know, experiencing all these calamities and all these um the outpouring of the bowl judgments the trumpet judgments and you know earth has gone 
uh, uh, through this major events and destructions and so clearly there can be a supernatural um, God can supernaturally just clear it up but I think time will be needed just to show and prove that um, you know these things need to, to take place Daniel then goes into his eternal rest and he will rise again we will obviously meet him one day um, you will not experience the tribulation and we will not experience the tribulation and we thank God for that. That has been the conclusion of the book of Daniel chapter 12 comes to an end and from now on our next attempt will then be to look at the book of Revelation and then start um, studying, studying the book of Revelation with the book of Daniel in mind and seeing how this is going to play out over a period of uh, seven years, how this tribulation is going to play out over a period of seven years. Stay blessed.